Don't shoot, I beg you. I'm Polish. I'm Polish. Come Please. down! Please. I'm Polish. Please. Please. He's Polish. Yes, he's Polish. Why the fucking coat? I'm cold. So today I saw a video in which the Russian ambassador to Poland uh, got attacked with red paint by anti-Russian activists. Uh, and they were screaming at this uh, Russian ambassador, calling him a fascist and whatnot. And uh, this Russian ambassador was about to lay a wreath in honor of all of the uh, Soviet soldiers who died fighting the Nazis. And these activists prevented him from laying the flowers in honor of those who died fighting the German fascists, fighting the German Nazis, the very monsters who murdered millions of Polish people. And I am certain that there are Poles who laughed at this and they supported these activists and they supported what these activists did and they said, oh yes, great, Slava Ukraina, blah, 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 blah. This is awesome because the Russians, you know, the Russians are evil and this ambassador deserves it. And it's like, this guy is an ambassador. You can't blame this ambassador for the policy of his country. But yet they attacked this guy and they attacked him as he was laying, as he was trying to lay flowers down in honor of those who died fighting the Nazis. Well, how the hell does that look good for your cause? It's, it's horrendous. This was not right. And what's disturbing is that there are people in Poland who support such an action. Uh, and there are people even in the Polish government who support this sort of thing. Uh, the Polish interior minister, Mariusz Kaminski, for example, uh, said that, the, uh, that these protesters' anger uh, was understandable. And it's understandable why these people would do this to the Russian ambassador. And he said, quote, The gathering of opponents of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, where genocidal crimes are committed every day, was legal. The emotions of Ukrainian women who took part in the protest and whose husbands are bravely fighting to defend their homeland are understandable. Which soldiers? Which soldiers fighting for Ukraine? Azov? Because everybody's talking about Mariupol and the Azovstafol uh, uh, plant that these Azov Nazi fighters are hiding in. I saw this thing. I couldn't believe it. I talked about this in my uh, in, in in my last video. There are people on Instagram saying, "Oh, please donate money to these Azov fighters. Donate money to help these Azov fighters because they're defending Mariupol." And it's like, who are these Azov fighters? Yesterday, I saw this Ukrainian activist. She posted a photo of some Azov fighter looking miserable in front of the camera because supposedly he's been under this plant, uh, you know, defending Mariupol against the evil Russians. And she said something like, look at how exhausted this guy's face is. Look at the results of, of, what, of, of war just in a matter of months. Look at what war can do to a man in a matter of months. He looks exhausted. This is why we have to donate money to this organization so we can help the, the last defenders of Mariupol. And on this photo of this Azov fighter, I saw the word Azov on his uniform. And it had the... And just to make it worse, it had the Nazi black sun symbol on his uniform. The non and she's asking for donations to help this guy and to help his friends, to help his gang. And it's like, yeah, you have Russia invading Mariupol, Russia invading Ukraine, but wh who's defending Mariupol? Just because somebody is invaded doesn't mean they deserve my indiscriminate support. Because I look at the photo of this Azov fighter and I see the black sun! 
This is a Nazi symbol. And please don't give me this garbage. Well, it's an Indo-European symbol. And the reason why they wear it is to remember their Indo-European roots. Excuse me. Don't pull that sophistry on me. That's not going to work on me. That is not going to work on me because the black sun symbol, the insignia, is directly rooted in Nazi ideology. The Nazis put that damn thing on some castle where they would uh, go there to meditate or something like that. And they put that, they, they, the Nazis put the black sun on some, inside of some castle in Germany. And they did so because they believed that it was a part of some sort of ancient Aryan pre Christian civilization. And it's not some symbol that's just part of this continual tradition within Ukraine or within Eastern Europe. Uh, because those do exist. This is directly a Nazi symbol. And it's like, why is why is Azov putting this on their uniforms? Oh, because they're Nazis. Oh, yeah. And now they're asking for a donation. So I wrote this I wrote this uh, Ukrainian activist and I said to her, excuse me, on the photo, it says Azov and has the Nazi black sun. What gives? I thought you guys weren't Nazis. Because this very Ukrainian activist put on her Instagram account that Oh look, uh, Putin calls us Nazis, so so uh, you know this is ridiculous. We're not Nazis, yada yada yada. And I'm like, well, you say you're not Nazis, but yet the photo that you put when you're asking for donations has a guy with a Nazi symbol. What what gives? What's up with that? And she goes, oh well, you don't know anything, and yeah, blah blah blah. And she eventually blocked me. It's like, <laughs> okay, but it tells me something. But here you have a Russian ambassador. Uh, in Poland, about to lay a wreath in honor of those who died fighting the Nazis who murdered millions of Poles, and they put red paint on this guy's, or it wasn't red paint, it was like red syrup, I think, on his face, and they called him a fascist. It's like, this guy's putting a wreath to honor those who killed fascists. What kind of nonsense is this? It's, it's garbage. And what's amazing is that the Poles told this guy, don't lay wreath for those who died fighting in World War II. It's like, well, What? This is his history. Of course he has the right to lay flowers for those who died fighting the Nazis. This is like telling an American ambassador in Iraq, hey, uh, don't say anything about 9-11 because, you know, that could insult some people because America did invade this country. It's like, no, th that's just, that's nonsense. It's like, th I can't believe this is, I can't believe this is Poland. I thought Poland was a country that, it, it prided itself in 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 fighting fascism and this guy this this russian ambassador was going to lay flowers down in remembrance of those who died fighting fascism and you tell him hey don't do that that's like telling a christian to not display anything about his faith i mean it's 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 horrendous but you know in all fairness there was a polish official who said that this was wrong uh, the Polish foreign minister, Zbigniew Rao, stated, quote, by all means, uh, he, he described this incident as, quote, by all means regrettable and an incident that should not have happened. And he said, quote, diplomats enjoy special protection regardless of the policies pursued by the governments they represent. This uh, act of, um, of uh, provocation and, and really... Um, this act of putting uh, red syrup on this guy's face was organized by a woman, in a, a Ukrainian activist. Her name is Irina Zemelyana. She's a Ukrainian activist. She supposedly works for some organization called Open Dialogue. They are Polish people on Twitter saying that this was planned out by the Russians in order to make Poland look bad or in order to make the pro-Ukraine cause look bad. I'm not entirely certain how they could prove that, but whatever. Uh, the fact is that this happened and there are people in Poland who think this is great. I find if Polish people think this is great, I find that just wrong. OK, and there are other words that I can use, but I'm going to put it in a very simple way. It's wrong. Uh, for one thing, was it not Soviets who fought against Ukrainian fascists? I mean, there's a there's a book that I that I read uh, last year. It was called. Um, what was it called? It was called Poland's Holocaust by Tadeusz Petrowski, an excellent book written by a Polish academic. Wonderful book. If you want to learn more about how the Poles suffered under both the Soviet Union and the Third Reich, and especially under Ukrainian uh, nationalism in uh, East Galicia and in uh, Lvov, uh, Volinia, then I would highly recommend that you read this book. It is a long book, but very, very detailed book. 
And in that book, Petrovsky, who is an honest critic of both the, 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 the Third Reich, the Ukrainian nationalists, and also a critic of Polish people who, uh, who collaborated uh, with the Soviets and the Nazis, uh, but also he's a, an, uh, an honest critic of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of the Soviet Union. Uh, Tadeusz Petrovsky admits in the book that Soviet forces fought against Ukrainian fascists. And this Russian ambassador is about to lay flowers in honor of those people, and he gets red syrup put on his face. You know, it reminds me of the French. It reminds me of the French. If you go to France and you start speaking English, I heard that French people will act very uh, disrespectful towards you. They don't like it when people speak English. And I have heard that if you go to France and you speak Spanish, they're okay with you. But if you go to France and start speaking English, they get pissed off at you. And I think that's disgusting. Um, I, don't, I have no desire ever to go to France. I heard that Paris is a dump. All these women want to go to Paris. They think it's romantic or something like that. Oh, I want to go to Paris. I want to go to France. They go to Paris. They end up picking up an, uh, you know, an STD from some guy named Pierre or something like that. I don't know. I'm joking. Okay, that was a that was that was a nice one to quote Chris Rock. That was a nice one. Okay, but it's just it's 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 completely overrated. But they say if you go to France, they disrespect you if you speak Eng if you speak English. I think that's disgusting behavior. It's so disgusting. I watched the film Saving Private Ryan. I watched a little bit of this film a couple of days ago. I've watched that film numerous times in my life. I think it's a masterpiece, arguably the greatest film ever made, Saving Private Ryan. It is a masterpiece of a film. It was made in the 1990s, and it still looks amazing. And there, I watched a little bit of that opening scene that everybody talks about. It's when the Americans are landing on, on Normandy Beach, D-Day, as it's known. And the Germans are just slaughtering these American soldiers they're cannon fodder. They're slaughtering these American soldiers like like nothing, mowing these guys down with heavy machine guns, and these these American soldiers are, are just dropping dead, being slaughtered. One guy is screaming for his mother. It's it's so. It really disturbs me. He's screaming for his mother. One guy is his arm is on the floor. He's in shock. He's picking up the arm with his other hand. It's it's horrendous. It's horrendous, and thousands of them. And you know what's so horrendous? Oh, it's a movie. It's excuse me. This all happened. Okay, this is what happened. Thousands of American soldiers died on Normandy Beach, and of course, there were Canadians who were there. They were British who were there. And if you go to France, they get mad at you for speaking English. And it's like you know what? Screw you and screw your country. This is dis it's disgusting. All these people died fighting to to defend to liberate your country. And you get mad at people for speaking the language of those people. It's like, to hell with you. To hell with your country. To hell with the French. It's, it's hor horrendous behavior. It's horrific. But it's like, for these, for these people to, to, put, to, to splatter paint on this Russian guy. I mean, if, Russia, if Polish people support this, then that's disgusting. It really is. Uh, but this woman who, who organized this, this, this act of assault on this Russian ambassador, she's Ukrainian. I'm not certain about the the ethnicities of the other peoples of this of this crowd. They could be uh, Ukrainian, Polish, a mix of the two. I don't know, uh, but it's amazing. You know, of course, she, you know she's Ukrainian. Of course, she doesn't give a damn about uh, Soviets who died fighting the Nazis because more than likely, her being Ukrainian, she comes from a culture where they praise mass murderers. They praise people like Andrei Melnik and Stepan Bandera, all of whom were murderers. They praise the OUN, which was an organization of murderers. You know, I, I read the book on the slaughter of the Poles. I read about the horrors that the Polish people went through. It breaks my heart, you know, and a lot of Polish people got upset at me for the video that I did about them. And not about them, but about how I think, you know, if Poland ever had the chance, it would take Lvov, it would take Volinia. And a lot of you guys got mad at me because you think that I'm describing your country as an aggressor. You think I'm describing your country as, a, as an expansionist country. For one thing, if Poland ever decided to take Lvov and Volinia and East Galicia, I wouldn't blame Poland. I wouldn't condemn Poland for that because all of that historically was Poland. <laughs> so I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, yes, Poland is evil. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and do that. So I wasn't trying to condemn Poland. I was simply taking a realist perspective and saying, hey, if Poland never had the chance, then 
they they would they would uh, uh, take those areas, and I still hold on to that position. You know, it makes you wonder about why Poland has been so adamant about sending in a peacekeeping force into you into Western Ukraine. You know, when you talk about peacekeeping forces, uh, a lot of that is very much so. Um, a lot of that comes from just generally speaking. A lot of that comes from a motive of expanding hegemony. Uh, a great example of this is Russia. I mean, after the war, uh, the last war between Armenia and, and Azerbaijan was concluded, and believe me, that's not the last of it. It's going to resume itself. But after that war was uh, temporary, temporarily uh, ceased through a Russian-brokered uh, ceasefire, Russian thousands of Russian soldiers were placed, or I think nearly... 2,000 or so soldiers were placed in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is the, the whole center of contention between the Azeris and the Armenians. And it's like, well, why are, why are Russian soldiers put there? Well, it's obvious why, because Russia wants to expand its, its, its uh, hegemony. Uh, those areas used to be controlled by the Soviet Union, and so it makes sense that Russia would want, that, want those regions within their sphere of influence. Same thing with Ukraine, same thing with Georgia. That's why Russia supports those two... Uh, self-declared autonomous regions in Georgia. What is it? Uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, same thing with Transnistria. Um, you know, Turkey does the same thing. Oh, yeah, we're putting soldiers in northern Syria. Why? You want to conquer Syria? No, no, no. We just want to be there to fight Tur Kurdish terrorists. Oh, okay. But there's, a, there's, a, there's another motive why. Of course, Turkey wants to fight those terrorists. I'm not doubting that. But at the same time, Turkey wants to expand its own hegemony. It just makes sense to me. Um, you know, a lot of you Polish people, and I don't say that in a demeaning way, but a lot of you guys have this sort of idealistic, idealistic way of thinking. No, Poland would never do that. No, my country would never do that. But, you know, history, and I say this with all respect, I mean, history tells us otherwise. History is is like life. You know, human life, life in general, is filled with surprises. One day you had the greatest day ever. You you met the woman of your dreams. You went out to a party. You got drunk. You had a great time. The next day you get a phone call saying that one of your parents has cancer and, and they only have like six months to live. I mean, like life hits you like that's the, that's the most horrifying aspect of life is like, I don't know what tomorrow hides for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what, what tomorrow holds for me. But the same thing goes. In a, the same thing can be applied in a collectivist sense. To today, you have the, you, you think everything is great, and then tomorrow you have tanks rolling through your streets. You don't know what's going to happen. One day you're have, you're feeling great. The next day, oh yeah, there's a pandemic and a new disease has come. Stay home all day. Life surprises us, and I think that as as the years go by, life is going to surprise us like this. You know, I didn't expect Russia to invade Ukraine so soon. I knew eventually there was going to be a war. It's very obvious what's been from what's been happening in Donbass in the last eight years. But but I didn't expect them to invade Ukraine like that so quickly. But it happened. Um, and, and it, you know, it makes you wonder why, for example, uh, the, the who is the um, Andre Duda, uh, who is the I think he's the, the president of of Pol I, mean, I got to look this up real quick. President of Poland. Was it Andrzej Duda? I think it's Andrzej. Yeah, Andrzej Duda. I, I, I think that's how you pronounce his name. But he stated that, you know, eventually there's going to be no border between Ukraine and Poland. And it's like, really? I mean, go to Ukraine and tell them, hey, <laughs> there's going to be no po border between you and Poland. But what does that even mean? Well, it means there's going to be this, you know, amnesty and uh, amistad and friendship and harmony between us. We're all going to be brothers. It's like, well, that, that that that's not realistic. That doesn't work that way. If there was no border between Ukraine and Poland, that means that Ukraine and Poland become one country. And what's the name of what's the name of that country going to be? Is it going to be Poland or is it going to be Ukraine? Is Ukraine going to become a province of 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 uh, Poland? Is it going to become a province of of uh, Warsaw or, or Krakow? Um, is it, like, like, how is this going to work? You know, it's like someone's going to, some, there's going to have to be a government. Who's going to control that government? Well, it's going to be a mix between Poles and Ukrainians. Well, yeah, but what are you going to do with all the Ukrainian far-right lunatics? They're not going to like that. They're going to rebel. And, they, they, and they could commit another massacre like they did back in the Second World War in Volhynia and Lviv, East Galicia. It's like, how does this work? You know, and, and, and there were, you know, this sort of idealistic rhetoric was, was being stated 
back in the uh, in the first half of the 20th century. I did a little bit of reading today about one of Poland's great national icons, Joseph uh, uh, Pilsudski. He believed in, uh, he at least stated that he wanted uh, an independent Ukraine as alongside an independent Poland. Independent from what? Obviously independent from Soviet power because both the Ukrainians and the Poles were dealing with Soviet expansionism. The Poles were very confident that they could fight and defeat the Soviets because the Poles were able to keep the Soviet the Soviets at bay. They were able to hinder Soviet expansion into Poland. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so Joseph Pilsudski said, let's go to war with the Soviet Union. There were many people in the Polish government who said that this was going to be a bad idea. There was one political faction uh, uh, called the National Democrats who stated that Going to war with the Soviet Union was a bad idea because Poland did not have the strength nor the military uh, might to fight uh, something like the Soviets, something like the Soviet Union. But Joseph Pilsudski didn't want to listen to any of this, and he believed the only way to settle the problems with the Soviet with the Soviets with the Bolsheviks was on the battlefield. Regardless of this, the Bolsheviks sent a message of peace to the Poles and said, hey, let's have a, a peace agreement. We can have a ceasefire. Many people in Poland said, yes, let's do this because they didn't want to go to war with the Soviets. And that's understandable because who the hell wants to go to war? Joseph Pilsudski <clears throat> pretended to participate in peace talks, peace negotiations, but behind the curtains, he was preparing for a war and he made an alliance with the Ukrainians. And at the time, the Ukrainians were under a guy named Simon Petliura. I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. But Petliura was the, the leader of the, uh, the Ukrainian People's Republic. The Ukrainian Republic. Petliura was a huge nationalist. And under his reign, there were also a lot of uh, pogroms against Jews in Ukraine. A lot of Jews, thousands of Jews were butchered in these pogroms. It was pretty horrendous. And uh, Petliura and, and, and uh, Pilsudski made this deal. Now, before this, there was a war between Poland and Ukraine. Uh, there was a war over territory. They were fighting over Lvov and over East Galicia and Volhynia. The reason why, uh, and, and historically, these regions were Poland, right? Historically, these regions were Polish, uh, but the Ukrainians managed to seize this uh, territory um, uh, I think it was not too long after the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire or something like that. But the, the, the Ukrainians managed to seize these regions. The Poles had a war with um, had a war with the Ukrainians because uh, they were Ukrainians who refused to be under Polish rule. Uh, U Ukrainians went to war with Poland. Poland won. And this happened from, uh, I want to say... Uh, uh, late 1918 into the summer of 1919, there was a so there was a, a victory for Poland. Poland took those regions. They took Lvov, East Galicia, Volhynia, and they put those regions under Polish rule. And uh, <clears throat> then after that, the Poles and the Ukrainians made a deal to to make an alliance to fight against the Russians. E, the Ukrainians still believe that those regions belong to them. And uh, part of the alliance was that Ukraine would agree not to make any more claims on those territories. And Ukraine made this agreement. Ukraine agreed to this, right? But that didn't last very long. So the, the Pilsudski attacked the, the, the Soviets and uh, Pilsudski and his Ukrainian ally uh, invaded central Ukraine and they took the city of Kiev. Uh, and they thought, wow, we won. This is amazing. And the Soviets didn't really put much of a fight and the Soviets retreated. So they said, we won. This is amazing. Look, we look, look. And they took like 20,000 uh, Soviet uh, prisoners of war. But the Poles sort of fell into a trap because, yeah, the Soviets retreated, but now Poland has stretched itself thin and is in the middle of central Ukraine and they're surrounded by a bunch of Soviets who just retreated but they were going to come back and eventually the Poles and the Ukrainians lost and they had to retreat themselves. So it's like, okay, you had a war between Poland and Ukraine over these regions and Poland won, but then they became friends after that and then uh, that friendship quickly disintegrated because Ukrainian nationalism became very 
became very popular. The Ukrainians wanted those regions back from Poland. And when Germany invaded Poland, those Ukrainian nationalists were armed and trained by the Germans. And those nationalists took the slaughtered the Poles living in those regions. And they said, okay, now this is our region. They took, they slaughtered the Poles in Volinia, East Galicia, Lvov. I've said this so many times, I remember the name of these, these areas. So it's like, okay, you had a war, and then you became friends, and then the Ukrainians uh, slaughtered you. And now Poland and, and, and Ukraine are, are friends again. <laughs> but for decades, there has been tensions between the, between the two countries over the, the slaughter. Because Poland has never forgotten that, and neither should they forget it. But now I'm getting messages from Poles telling me who cares about Volinia. I'm get, getting messages from Poles telling me this. Who cares? So what? There was a massacre. I remember four years ago, I did a video about the tension between Poland and, and Israel. And I had so many Polish people writing me. I had thousands upon tens of thousands of people in Poland watching my watch who, who watched that video. Many Poles wrote me and they told me about Volinia and they said, we'll never forget what happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Ukraine still denies the massacre. Ukraine banned the showing of a film on the massacre. And now I'm having Poles telling me who cares about Volinia, who cares about East Galicia, who cares about all that stuff. I'm, I'm, I can't believe, I'm, I'm, I imagine these Poles are Zoomers, because this is how Zoomers talk. This is not how millennials and, and, and boomers talk. This is how Zoomers talk. Oh, yeah, who cares? You know, let's just listen to mumble rap and just ex absorb the LGB, ra ra let's wave the rainbow flag, and who cares? Who cares about all this stuff? I feel like I'm living in a, in, a, in a skit from Millennial Thinker. You know, some Zoomers from Poland are telling me, who cares about millennia? Who cares about the fact that Ukrainian nationalists skinned people alive and raped women and cut people's eyeballs out and cut people to pieces? Who cares about any of that stuff? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares about the fact that this country denies that any of this happened? Who cares about the fact that this country, Ukraine, not only denies it but wants to hinder any sort of dissemination of information on this massacre, who cares that Ukraine banned this film? Who cares that Ukraine glorifies the OUN who committed these massacres? Who cares? Let's just let's just make friends with Paul, with Ukraine because it's good for us, advantageous for us, so we can we, we can use Ukraine to fight against the Russians. That's all this is. It's political advantageousness. That's all it is. It's opportunism, and you guys are falling right for it. It's disgusting. It really is. It's disgusting. Anyway, those are my thoughts for this video. You guys just heard some Theo Logi. God bless.